Our mission, Helping Parents Heal, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting parents whose children have passed. Through support and resources offered, we aspire to help individuals become shining light parents, meaning a shift from a state of emotional heaviness to one of hopefulness and greater peace of mind. Helping Parents Heal goes a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence in a non-dogmatic way. Helping Parents Heal affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background, and encourage open dialogue. Attendance at this meeting is voluntary. We hope that participants will learn from and share with each other. Discussions here are confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Zoom meetings run by leadership are not confidential. These meetings typically feature guest presenters and are posted on YouTube so that affili affiliate members worldwide can watch and benefit. Neither type of helping parents heal meeting is designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers, allowing parents to learn about many possible ways to heal. This includes presenters covering progressive topics, such as afterlife evidence and connecting with our children who've passed. The views expressed by our guest speakers may or may not reflect the opinions of Helping Parents Heal leaders and members, so we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. And I just wanted to add a little personal note. Um, my sister, Judy and I, and many of you met Judy at the conference, had a reading with George just seven months after Carly passed. We were astonished by the evidence presented to us that day. George relayed a nickname that my mom called Judy and I. She called us my girls. He gave us the name of our step-grandmother and a message of apology from her. He also assured me that Carly stated that her passing was as easy as stepping through a doorway and that my mom was there to greet her. Anyone familiar with my journey knows the significance of George's book, Walking in the, Through the Garden of Souls, my Bible as I call it, and I'll treasure my autographed copy forever. So it's just an honor to welcome George this evening. Thank you, George. It Thank you kindly. And if it's okay, I'll read your bio, but I don't have to, George. If you would prefer to just jump in, you're welcome to do so. So whichever you'd like to do. Do you want me to go ahead and tell people? Sure. A little bit? Okay, that would be wonderful. So for more than 40 years, George Anderson has been able to bridge the world of the hereafter and of earth through his ability to communicate messages of hope from those we love who have passed on. Since the age of six, after suffering a near fatal illness, George has had a special relationship with the souls who depend on his ability to hear them and bring peace and comfort to their, uh, to their families who have had them pass. He is widely considered by those in the medical, scientific and religious fields to be the world's greatest living medium. George Anderson has dedicated his life to helping people with loved ones who have passed uh, heal by delivering messages of hope from their loved ones. In his career, George has done more than 35,000 sessions for those who have loved ones on the other side and is the most scientifically tested medium of this century. He has earned the respect and acclaim of those who work in scientific, medical, and religious fields, not only due to his ability, but his dedication to those who have a loved one on the other side. Researchers in the field of science, afterlife studies, and spirituality have called George astonishing, the gold standard by which all mediums are measured, and a Stradivarius among mediums. He continues to work with people from all over the world. His work has been filmed for dozens of talk shows and television programs, including Lifetimes Beyond Chance, CBS News' 48 Hours, HBO's Life After Life, um, Unsolved Mysteries, Nippon Japan TV's World's Most Extraordinary People, NBC's The Extraordinary, NBC Put, uh, put to the Test, BBC London's Incredible Journey, and CNN 
uh, CNN's Larry King Live. His work has also been featured in dozens of national newspapers and magazines. George is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Lessons from the Light, Walking in the Garden of Souls, Ask George Anderson and is the subject of the national bestseller, We Don't Die, We Are Not Forgotten, and Our Children Are, for, are Forever. His books have sold over uh, one million copies. And without further ado, please join me and Irene and Carly in welcoming <laughs> the wonderful George Anderson. Welcome, George. Welcome. Thank you so much. So before we get started, Irene had a question that she wanted to ask you so that maybe we can have other people think of questions that they'd like to ask. Um, Irene, would you like to go ahead and uh, ask George again so that we can all benefit from his answer? Yes. So George, uh, many parents struggle with contacting and having a session with a medium because they've been taught in their religion that they are not supposed to do so, that they should not be contacting a spirit. Can you expand on that a little bit, please? Well, uh, anybody who knows me knows I'm traditionally Roman Catholic. Um, I attend mass, the traditional Latin mass. I don't like any of that Novo Soto, I call it hippie stuff. Um, and it's become a great comfort for me the two Sundays a month. And the priest that conducts it, you can tell he's very into what he's doing and firmly believes in it. So I'll go to the mass, communion, so forth. I still consider myself traditionally Roman Catholic, but only on a spiritual basis. Now, in regards to what I do, sometimes people may misunderstand. Um, I don't conjure nor um, question. I just discern. So the loved ones, whether it be your youngster or other people that have passed on will come forward of their own free will and it's not a two-way conversation so I feel their presence and they seem to respond even more so when um, they hear their, your, the loved one's voice here and um then they start to impart their messages. They usually will revisit how they passed to a certain degree and what it felt like. But I like that their messages are very comforting and reassuring to their loved ones left behind here, especially not only the parents, but the siblings as well. And um, I'm the, I always say I'm just the paint job. You know, I'm just the instrument. And sometimes what I find fascinating in the session is who, you know, people that you can, you may least expect may also show up. Everybody seems to like to be remembered and acknowledged. And even though I know people couldn't remember everybody in two seconds, um, they will come forward regardless. And just to greet seems to be very special for them. And to be remembered, well, that, you know, definitely puts them on a tremendous high. But um, it's just that when people's youngsters come through, uh, are discerned, 
the first thing they usually impress upon me to say is without you know the subject giving me any information um that they're all right in the perpetual light and in a happy place and sometimes they may say they're in a safe place and as the session develops, I'll find out why they emph emphasize that. And, but I mean, they'll also bring in some times that they didn't suffer at the time of passing, that even if they've contributed to ending their own life, they're not burning in hell or something of that nature, as there are people who still, because of, you know, religious teaching feel that way or people that lost an infant before he or she was baptized. I've had people being afraid it's come up in the session that they're in limbo, which the souls have told me there's no such place. Um, it's just a doctrine that we've been taught taught to believe in. And also, um, I was always curious about the belief in purgatory because the souls from the hereafter have told me where the souls in purgatory, that um, there isn't, you know, a purgatory over there, but there isn't a fire in brimstone hell, but there is the darker levels, but God doesn't condemn you there. You condemn yourself there if you've been a wretched person here on the earth and have had no concern for anyone but yourself. Um, you will spend time in the darker levels but you'll always have the opportunity to go into the perpetual light, but it's up to you to find it. And other souls over there sometimes will go down to those lower levels to help those there to redeem themselves. And some have not really... Um, taken them up on their offer. There's some individuals there who've been there for what we would see as centuries. And um, somebody such as a Joseph Stalin or um, Hitler, you know, they have decided not to redeem themselves. And, and but again, as was stated, the door is never closed. The opportunity is always there. Certain individuals who have been sainted by the church, I give them the title that they earned as much as I called my dentist doctor last week. Um, they will go to the lower levels to try to administer to them and I've come to realize that um, when you hear the soul state that he or she is all right and in a happy, safe place and in the perpetual light, it can just in that statement be very comforting to the survivor here, you know, survivors here. Um, Pardon me if I'm sniffling. The allergies are driving me out of my mind. Um, but the... I think people have to focus on... I remember from old, you know, traditional Catholic prayers, eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let the perpetual light shine upon them. And... That is very um, profound because that's where most 
souls go to. So your youngsters would certainly be there. And if relatives close to you or them are there ahead of time, they usually are there to welcome them over. And they may at times not mean this in an insensitive manner, but individuals will say your loss is our gain. And, um, and then they continue going on with their lives in the light. Uh, I do look forward to it one of these days. Um, but, you know, you don't get there until you're supposed to get there. And even though I had a few close calls last year, health-wise, I'm still here. So I guess they are not interested in having me there yet. Well, I'm sure that they'll love having you at some point, but we have some other questions that we'd love to have you answer. And the first one that I think is actually kind of interesting, and maybe I need to explain it a bit. Um, Nancy H. is saying, do you feel that we as Shining Light parents have a particular role in the bigger picture of the spiritual evolution of the world? So we call ourselves Shining Light parents instead of bereaved parents because bereaved is one of the saddest words in the dictionary. And we feel that the light of our children shines through us. So do you think that, I guess Nancy's asking if we have a particular role in the bigger picture of the spiritual evolution of our world? <clears throat> Yes, absolutely. There are people have to realize that um, before we're born, we basically, there's a scheduled time that we're born and a scheduled time that we, it's already been set up that we pass on. Um, but the thing is, that can be so heartbreaking for parents or siblings here because you never expect that to be happening to you specifically. And even if the youngster passes on tragically or from a dreadful illness or such, it's all part of their unique spiritual experience. And the parent should always remember as the survivors and the siblings that they served a unique purpose in walking that experience with them um, to get them to move on. No matter what, we still would rather have them here physically than spiritually but as they always say, this is the best I can do right now, and it's better than nothing. And, and I always think it's very lovely when you hear from those who have passed on that they were welcomed over by family pets because the animals instantly put you at ease. You know it's only unconditional love it's also the sign of a happy passing and the animals come with compassion. They're very therapeutic and are so excited to be reunited with the loved one. That's beautiful. So Nancy, a different Nancy is asking, can you explain the transitioning process for those afflicted with dementia? Um, considering patients frequently experience a lot of fear. Um, and she's saying, especially since they may no longer remember, I guess, past religious upbringing, but especially just their own past lives or very recent lives, I suppose. Um, is there any way that you could maybe describe the, the passing for someone with dementia? Are they able, is it possible to connect with them? Um, for instance, or to connect with someone who has uh, who's in a coma um, while they are still alive. 
Well, usually in the dementia case, that's a condition of the flesh. So when you pass on, that's no more because it was your physical body that had that handicap. Um, they normally will reach out in some way, even if they just say, I'm all right, and back to my old self. And because they do come in a manner that they assume we know what they're talking about. And many times I'll just tell people, well, they're impressing me with this and asking, do you understand? And they'll say yes. And they may not even mention that um, of what they passed on from. But what was the other part of the question you had? Well, I guess that um, seeing what she was saying is that seeing that they experience a lot of fear from not remembering um, at the uh, towards the end of their lives, um, I would assume that all of that fear is taken away the minute that they get over there, though. Is that correct? Sure, it's exactly because you're the only thing that's changed is form you withdraw from this suit you're wearing right now and you go back to your old self in any case. And people should understand it's easier said than done that there's nothing to be afraid of. I think the souls have told me that people are more afraid of the circumstances that will lead up to their passing as opposed to the initial moment. Um, nobody wants to spend time in a nursing home or you know, be completely out of touch or in dreadful suffering. Um, I did a session not too long ago for a woman who volunteered uh, euthanasia is legal where she lives in Canada and she she was suffering unquestionably with cancer for a period of time and she finally made the decision to be put to sleep so to speak and she was fine over there and completely freed from the illness and certainly did not feel she made a wrong choice. Um, this is the only way she was able to get away from that dreadful illness. If she decided to stay, that would be of her own free will. But I do think... In my personal opinion, I do feel we should have the right to make that decision when it appears nothing, there's no hope left. And as much as it's draining on you as the victim, it certainly can be draining on family as well. So I often feel euthanasia should be legal here but I think the big dead end with it is organized religion that um, they are afraid people will use it carelessly and I don't think that's the case I think that you should have the right to put that in your will as I have a living will that um, if it ever gets to the point that there's nothing further can be done and you're never going to go back to your normal self, it's better, I think, to let them put you to sleep and relieve you of your pain and suffering. I'm sure many people's youngsters have gone through that and of course, you don't want to let them go. Um, I have had people 
come through over the years that were in a coma, but even though their physical body is being kept artificially alive, they've left, they're over there and they come through and will remark that they are, their physical body is still alive artificially in a coma but they withdrew of their own free will instead of feeling as though they're trapped between the two dimensions and are pleased that they left and have gone there. Very interesting. So we have Patty asking, does a mother who passes and leaves very young children behind feel pain in leaving her child? Uh, does she remain in their lives on a soul level? Yes, she still remains closer to them than they could imagine. Um, I always say to people, don't feel bad if you don't comprehend that, because I don't comprehend it either, because we relate to things on a physical level. But it can be frustrating for a parent to go and see that they've left individual children behind, but they will all be together again someday. And also that instance may be part of the soul's unique experience here that they have to you know, survive with that and live with that. But they should know that the parent is always near to them in a very loving and helpful way. Um, I think sometimes people are inclined to think just because you pass on, you suddenly understand nuclear physics. Um, not the case it's everything has to be learned and experienced for ourselves and even though i have discovered that being a bereaved parent is by far the most difficult experience uh the soul's here that have been through that are should also be proud of themselves that they're survivors and their children will hope that they will continue to go on with their lives no matter what uh, another example is for some reason anybody viewing right now who is would perhaps agree with me being a widower is something men do not want to experience i know individuals that are widowers and they are just living accordingly until their time comes but um their wives are always with them or their husbands are always with them, just in a different form. And I think, you know, people sometimes have misconceptions about the hereafter. It's not a place to be afraid of or a place that you're going to be separated from your loved one. You will be separated by form but you'll still be very much with them no matter what. Uh, George, I think that you're the person that I read at one point who said that he had done a reading for a woman who um, transitioned, let's see, and went over and realized that she was over on the other side with her child. So <clears throat> that they had already been spending time together because time and space are not the same on the other side. It, does that sound 
like something that you may have said or was I am I mixing you up with someone else? I don't know. I would say that if your youngster passes before you, um, that when you do pass on, that they will be there to welcome you over. And they say that it's, there's been no, it'll seem like they passed on in one moment and you followed in the next. Right. Because there's no sense of time over there as we understand it. And um, I often state I'm looking forward to passing on and being welcomed over by my kitty cats that have gone over there, that that would be a great jubilant day for me. But when I'm supposed to go, I do not know. And I haven't been told. But that's another thing. You know, people think after a loved one passes on um, that it could be years and years before you see them. But nobody has any guarantee that they're going to be here next week. And it's so true. I mean, I could pass in my sleep tonight. There's no promise I'm going to wake up tomorrow. And there's no promise that I'll be here next week either. Right. Well, I have a question that I think is beautiful, and I'm hoping that you can help with it because I think that every parent here is wanting to know the answer to this question. What would you be your best advice, and this is Sandra who's asking, on how to learn to connect with our children who have transitioned? Well, many people in their um, sessions, uh, their loved one has come through and mentioned that there are different signs you can look for, but don't look so hard that you actually overlook. And usually they come in dreams is one, but the thing is, as long as the dream is a comforting visitation, that's real. Anything that would upset you, I always encourage people not to pay attention to it because that thing in our heads can play tricks on us as well. Many people state that they talk to their loved ones out loud. And the souls are very glad that we do that because you're sending them the message that your own subconscious is feeling their presence and it prompts you to speak to them. So by you speaking to them, they're very pleased that you're recognizing that they are indeed with you. Now, of course, you may not care to do it in the middle of a supermarket, but at home, in the privacy of your own home, I think it would be a lovely thing um, to do, to talk to them, always to pray for them, and when it comes to prayer, it doesn't necessarily mean Hail Marys and Our Fathers. You pray what comes from the heart of how you feel. And so you can, you know, I'm inclined to lean more toward traditional old Catholic prayers, but that's how I was brought up. But I always encourage people, say what comes from the heart because that is the purest form of prayer. Beautiful. Kathy is asking something, and I think that it kind of leads to a, a second part of the question. She's saying, in the case of the loss of multiple children, it seems to me that one soul is stronger in communication or takes the lead. Do souls learn to communicate with us? And I guess that more importantly, um, 
we we all believe that our kids are all working on the other side to help each other communicate with us but um is this something that you've heard that they're learning from each other to be able to communicate with us i think so because uh many souls have reported that they've met, met and made new friends over there particularly young people or such that have passed on in a way similar to theirs because this way it's understood and thus they can help one to help the other um I'm trying to remember anything else along those lines that I really should probably write down for myself the sessions, but I just, you know, do them. And, but so much has been learned and so many things have of what I consider a very high spiritual nature. Naturally, there are individuals here on the earth that do not believe in an afterlife at all. And someday they'll find out that I'm right as usual. But um, I remember one time I had attended synagogue with an acquaintance on the High Holy Day, Yom Kippur. And he did not believe in an afterlife. His attitude was six feet under, and that's the end of it. And yet on the High Holy Day, they would pray for the so-called dead. And I said to him after the service, why do you pray for the so-called dead if you don't believe in an afterlife, you're just wasting your time as far as I would consider. And he had never thought of that. And many people have, you know, their own interpretation of how they think things will go or are going. And each time I do a session, it may seem like one I've done before, but people will have lost someone under the same circumstances. So the same information is going to be used, as I put it, as a form of a shorthand to get me to cut to the chase. And you know, reach out accordingly. I look at it this way. The souls do the very best they can when they do reach out to us. But sometimes, too, people will feel that they will see a loved one in their own home, out of the corner of their eye. And we all do it. We'll make the mistake of turning suddenly. And it seems that the individual disappears because they're afraid they may have frightened us. And I mean, I'll get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And I remember one time, even though I put the light on, I still was half asleep. And I stopped suddenly in my hallway because I thought I was going to kick into one of my cats. And all of a sudden, the cat disappeared. So that was obviously one of my fur babies who had passed on that was still living here and appeared, caught me off guard and appeared to me, which I found very comforting and indeed didn't kick into them in the physical sense. So usually the souls in the hereafter will always use a phrase, refuse nothing, ask for nothing. And that seems to be 
a very interesting way to look at it. Refuse nothing that they would send to you and ask for nothing. Just let it happen when it's most or seems to be most convenient for you and for them. Because remember, the souls over there are still going on with their lives, just in a different dimension. And they do have, of their own choice, jobs there or certain things that they've chosen to do as a continuation of what they had been attracted to here on the earth. So... It's never a dull moment for them there. I think just being in the perpetual light, which they say they never tire of, and it's always like a perfect summer's day. And they have nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of, and certainly will go about their business there, but still connected with us in their way uniquely because they don't want anyone here on the earth to feel they've forgotten about them because they've left us in the flesh, that the um, form has changed. They'll still... Um, be there for us and closer to us than we can imagine. And again, as I said earlier, I still don't digest that maybe the way I should. I just don't understand. But when I get over there someday, I probably will. Beautiful. Well, I was wondering if you could tell us about a reading that you've done and the most amazing thing that you heard from uh, one of the loved ones on the other side about what it's like on the other side. We'd really like to hear about whether our kids are learning things, what they're doing over there. Um, obviously, they're not sitting around and waiting for us to arrive. They're doing other things. Again, I know that they're uh, working together to communicate with us. And the time is not the same over there. But have you heard any things that you can tell us um, to be able to reassure parents about what their kids are doing on the other side? Well, as was stated earlier, um, your youngsters will definitely um, find something that they were attracted to. Some work with animals, some work with children. Um, some, when they first get there, take a rest, especially if they've gone through a very turbulent health condition. They mean, may need a time to rest, so to speak. And some can be attracted to people here or there of with creative issues and try to help them to help themselves or continue with that um, from there. And the one thing that always is interesting to me is they always desire for us, for us to understand that they don't wave magic wands over there that they can't, you know, do for us the way we would like it. We all have to learn it for ourselves and they cannot trespass on our spiritual experience here any more than we could theirs. So, as I said, they make new friends over there. Um attracted to individuals who would be on the same wavelength as them. And so there's so many things that they are 
of their own free will able to do, but um, not to the point, I think, where they forget about us. Because even on a day I know I have to do sessions, I can start receiving messages here in my home as I'm getting ready. And somebody's um, youngster will come to me and say, my parents will be coming to you today and, you know, be ready for them. And things go in one ear and out the other. And yet when the session begins, I remember, oh, this is the youngster who came to me while I was busy getting dressed at home. And some of them will ask me to bring a particular sacramental or sometimes a spiritual um, thing of comfort that would be their way of letting you know that they're always very near no matter what. And that I find to be very comforting. Somebody could be having devotion with a particular saint and that saint, the image of that saint will be gotten by me to give to them in their youngster's loving remembrance. And that is something I always find to be extremely comforting and shows their ultimate compassion from over there because they certainly know what you as the parent or sibling is going through here. And sometimes they will say that Yes, many times I should say, they will say that they do miss you, but solely in the sense of form. They're not in physical body, you are. So that's the only thing that is between the two of you. But many times too, they may come through and speak of a crisis you may be going through. And they'll say they wish they were there physically to help you to help yourself. But they always state that they try to help you from the hereafter as best they can without trespassing on your spiritual journey. That's very interesting. I was wondering, you must have um, hundreds of kids that are hovering around you right now just because all of us are here with you. Is it hard to turn them on and off? And how do you do that? How is it that that works um, when you are in the presence of so many parents who have children who have transitioned? Well, normally it's I mean, this is my vocation. Um, when I have to work, I have to work. When I don't work, I don't. Um, I may feel, as I said, their presence on the day when I have to work. And they may give me a little bit of a head start. But most of the time, um, I would say nobody is ever pestering me or hanging around me constantly because they know I have my own direction to go in while I'm here. And certainly my subconscious needs a break every now and again. <laughs> Of course. So um, I wanted to rem remind everyone that um, George Anderson does these Facebook lives every every month. And the next one is going to be on the 15th at 630 in the evening. 
New York Times, so EDT. And you can go on this and be able to ask any of the questions that you'd like to. Um, people are also asking how to get an appointment with you. Do you have a long list or um, what, what is it like right now for you in terms I, of scheduling? I believe as of now, I'm booked into next year. If you go on the website, georgeanderson.com, it will have a listing of the availability and whether you desire in-person session or phone session. I always try to impress on people that there's no difference between a phone session and an in-person one. The only difference is, is you're not sitting in front of me. Um, many individuals will come as a family, come with their surviving children. And I'll always caution people when they come by phone or in person to definitely not have any preconceived expectations about the session because everyone is unique and different unto itself. Um, I always tell them, don't have your own mind made up that it should go a certain way or whatever. Just let your loved ones handle it. Let them, you know, send me the impressions and the feelings, and I'll be more than happy to relate them to you on their behalf. But I've gotten used to telling people now, let them... Oh, this runny nose. Um, sorry about that. Um, it's uh, what was I saying now? Um, Got news yeah, to just yeah, just let your loved ones handle it. Keep in mind though, they will come to you in a manner that they assume you know what they're talking about. Um, I've had sessions where somebody doesn't recognize a name or situation. But that's why I always encourage people to tape your session because while you're in the heart of it, you're being bombarded left and right. And you can't remember everybody in two seconds. I couldn't do it either. And this way, Robert usually tells people about the recording when they go home to put the recording away for a while, then revisit it when you're in a, you know, clearer state of mind. And um, he should know he's a bereaved sibling and he's had approximately three or four sessions with me where his brother, who is his best pal, has come through to him on numerous occasions. And the thing I found interesting is I never met his brother, but he told me that during the session, he felt as if it were a comforting visitation from his brother who passed on at the age of 34 from pancreatic cancer. And he said, you were using expressions, well, not me, but was saying expressions that he would use. And your hand mannerisms were very much like him, where after a while, I started feeling as though he was paying me a visit from the fact of you taking on many traits of his personality. Now, of course, as I said, I had never met him. And um, so he found that to be very comforting and consoling. And I wouldn't know that I was doing anything out of the ordinary. 
I'm sure that he found it very impactful to be able to have his brother come through and ha to have mannerisms and ways of uh, the way that you were saying things to be similar to his brother. Uh, I have one last question, if that's okay. And sure. I, think, I think that this is one to, to really, it's a great one to end with. Uh, Kathy is asking, in talking with the souls, what is the most impactful thing that you have learned from them? Great question. Um, let me think. Well, one thing I've learned from them, and I'm sure there's going to be people out there in your audience who will agree or disagree. I have learned that, in my personal opinion, forgiveness is overrated, even though were encouraged to do that, I can think of individuals who are not very nice to me that have passed on, and I really have no intentions of forgiving them, and you're not forced to. There may be parents viewing who have lost youngsters by murder or some horrific passing such as that. And I always tell people, be comfortable with yourself if you're not ready to forgive. Even sometimes the soul will come through from the hereafter and state that they're not ready to forgive even over there. And no force is exercised over there. It's all completely up to you as the soul or an individual here to find it for yourself what is the right way to go and if you've had such a tragedy in your life such as that if you don't feel you can forgive it's okay that you don't have to some woman had come to me who had a son that had died tragically and violently. And I told her that, and I was actually pleased that she said to me after the session, that was something that's always been preying on my mind because being brought up that you have to forgive she was afraid if she didn't forgive that she didn't know what would happen to her in the next stage. And she says, you've put my mind at rest because I'm not able to forgive here. And she touched upon what had happened. And I said, I can't say I blame you. I would wouldn't be able to forgive either. Some parents I've said, you know, in my opinion, revive the electric chair. I know that's not a nice thing to say, but if you've experienced such an ugly tragedy and you can't forgive, it's okay. You'll find it for yourself eventually. Thank you. I'm sure that that's reassuring to a lot of parents. In fact, we have a lot of people saying uh, thank you because they were they've been worried about that. So that's something that's very reassuring that they don't have to worry about forgiving if it is something that seems impossible to do. And um, I appreciate you being here. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions, but I hope that you'll come back and spend some time with us in the future. It would be really nice. And certainly, uh, likewise. And Irene probably has some other parting words she'd like to say. Go ahead, Just Irene. Thank you. Thank you, George. It's so great to see you and to be here with My you. My pleasure. For, every, for everyone to be here. And um, we always ask everyone to unmute and say thank you and good night. And we'll see you soon. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, George. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. George, Thank this has been interesting and helpful. Thank you, George, for everything. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you, George. Great. Thank you from the lake. Thank you, Thank you George. Thank you, George. Can't wait to hear you speak. Can't wait to hear you speak again, George. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful Good night, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good night. Good night.